All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, while we have more people continue to join the room, um, I want to thank you all for so much for joining us today um, at the Singh Health Deep Inners Global Health Institute's Global Health Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Glenn Cole. I'm an education associate here at SDGHI. Um, together with Dr. Yvonne Wong, um, we you know, host and organize these seminar series. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we start. You should be able to see a QA and a box on your Zoom bars. Please use that to let us know if you have any questions for our speaker today. And we'll have some time at the end of the session where we'll try to answer as many of your questions from that Q&A box. Uh, this is our first webinar of 2024, and we're kicking things off with the theme of humanitarian health. Um, today, we're honored to host Dr. Barry Levy, who's joining us today from the US. Uh, Dr. Levy is an adjunct professor from, of public health at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. He has spoken and written extensively on the health consequences of war. Uh, he wrote the book From Horror to Hope, Recognizing and Preventing the Health Impacts of War, and co-edited two editions of the book, War and Public Health. Dr. Levy has edited 19 other books on the health consequences of environmental and occupational hazards, climate change, and social injustice. He has also authored more than 250 journals and book chapters. He has worked in Thailand, China, Kenya, Jamaica, and several countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Dr. Levy is also a past president of the American Public Health Association and a recipient of its most prestigious award, the Cedric Memorial Medal. His lecture today is entitled The Health Consequences of War. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Levy. Thank you so much, Glenn, and good to be with you all uh, today. I'd like you to start with a um, uh, what we call a, an eyes closed exercise. So please close your eyes. I want you to imagine what it would be like to live in a war zone. Or if you have lived in a war zone or, or are living in a war zone, I'd like you to recall what it was like or experience what it is like. What do you see? What do you hear? What are you worried about? What will you do when your food is gone? What will you do when your water stops flowing? How will you communicate when your phone is no longer working and the internet is down? Well, where will you go if you or someone in your family is sick or injured and there's no medical care available? You can open your eyes now. This is just an exercise, but for many people throughout the world, living in a war zone is an unfortunate reality, a tragic reality all too often. Today, I want to talk about the adverse consequences of war, adverse health consequences, and talk about what can be done to address these uh, health consequences. There are many effects of war, adverse effects of war, including injury, disease, and premature death, mental and behavioral disorders, violations of human rights, forced displacement, damage to civilian infrastructure, damage to the environment, diversion of resources, and war leads to more war and other forms of violence. One fourth of the people worldwide live in regions directly affected by armed conflict. So roughly 2 billion people are living in war zones or close to war zones. Most wars today are civil wars in low and middle income countries. And in most wars, the vast majority of deaths are among civilians. If we go back 100 years ago, the vast majority of deaths were among military personnel. But over time, that, that percentage really has shifted so that the vast majority of deaths in most wars today are among non-combatant civilians. And there's a huge diversion of human and financial resources as a result of not only war itself, but the preparation for war. If we look at military expenditures by country, and these are data through the end of uh, 2022 from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, the United States far and away spends the most money, $877 billion uh, per year, at least during the year 2022, uh, on military expenditures, more than the next 10 countries combined. The United States ranks first in military expenditures among the nations of the world. We, we in the United States, or our government at least, ranks first in terms of uh, arms sales to other countries but we rank 35th in life expectancy among all the countries in the world and 43rd in infant mortality rate among, in, uh, among all the countries in the world. Our military budget in the United States is more than 250 times that of the United Nations, whose budget is a mere 3.5 billion. 
Dwight Eisenhower, who was president of the United States in the 1950s, perhaps said it better than anyone else concerning diversion of resources when he said that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. In contrast to the United States, Costa Rica has had no military since 1948. It has, to, has had political stability and economic prosperity during most of this period. It has it during since then it improved its medical care, education, and safety net. Its standard of living is almost double that of other Central American countries, except for Panama. And among all Central and South American countries, Costa Rica has the highest life expectancy, has a third lowest infant mortality rate, and third highest third highest adult literacy rate, uh, largely because it is not saddled by huge amounts of military expenditures. I want to first talk about and make a distinction between the direct impacts of war and the indirect impacts. And in the news media and even in our conversations among colleagues, we focus so much more on the direct impacts than the indirect impacts. And by direct impacts, we're largely talking about attacks with explosive weapons, some of which are indiscriminate attacks and others are specifically targeted against uh, individual uh, non-combatant civilians or communities, such as uh, the aftermath of this attack uh, on a village in Darfur many years ago. I want to list now the five indirect health impacts of war and talk a little bit about what causes them and what we can do about them. They are malnutrition, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, particularly exacerbation of pre-existing non-communicable diseases, adverse effects on reproductive health, and mental and behavioral disorders. Uh, these uh, indirect in health impacts of war actually occur much more frequently than the direct effects of explosive weapons. The causes of these indirect health effects are primarily forced displacement of populations and destruction of civilian infrastructure. And by civilian infrastructure, I mean damage to farms and the food supply system, water treatment plants and water supply lines. Uh, this is a picture taken during the first Persian Gulf War in 1991, when uh, the United States and its allies had bombed water treatment plants in and around um, uh, Baghdad. And women had no choice in, in terms of gathering water, had no choice but to gather water from the uh, Tigris River, which is uh, not untreated water, likely contaminated with microorganisms and perhaps pesticides as well. Other uh, parts of the infrastructure that get increasingly damaged during war are health care and public health services. This is a picture from the uh, destroyed city hospital in Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine, about two years ago. Uh, where there have been over a thousand uh, attacks, uh, in fact, in the first 18 months of that war, over a thousand attacks on health care, uh, over 400 uh, in which there were destroyed or damaged uh, hospitals, ambulances were attacked, almost 150 health workers were killed, um, and many uh, were also injured. In addition, many patients were killed and injured. And not shown on the slide is the fact that when uh, health facilities are damaged during war, they're no longer available afterward to provide ongoing health care to uh, the communities that they've been serving. Damage to infrastructure also includes damage to networks for that, that generate and supply electrical power, uh, communication, and transportation. And displacement, of course, involves both internally displaced people and refugees. Often the people who are internally displaced within their own country are worse off, their plight is worse, uh, than the refugees who make it to relative safety and security of other countries, although their lot, their, their plight is often not very, very good either. These are data on displaced people throughout the world uh, through the year 2020. Um, the top line shows internally displaced persons, the middle line refugees, and the bottom line asylum seekers. These numbers have all, at least the, the, uh, the total number, has increased by about a third since 2020. So now in 2024, the number of displaced people worldwide is approximately 108 uh, billion. And um, many of these are um, 
I'm sorry, it's at 108 billion. I, I, uh, so uh, that breaks down to uh, uh, about uh, 63, uh, uh, and um, uh, I misspoke. These are millions, I apologize. Um, so about 65 uh, uh, million people today are internally displaced persons and about uh, 35 million are refugees. In addition, there's about uh, 5,000 people who are asylum seekers and another 5,000, uh, another five, I'm sorry, I said 5,000, 5 million people who are asylum seekers and uh, another 5 million who are stateless people who are included in these, in these totals. Uh, and here are the numbers again. We must remember that whenever we look at statistics like this, each of these numbers are people uh, with the tears removed, you might say. There are uh, many challenges to obtaining data uh, during war. Uh, one is the fox fog or confusion that occurs during war. A second is that all parties to a war have incentives to either over-report or under-report. That is to underreport their own casualties and perhaps to overreport the casualties of the so-called en uh, enemy, or not to report at all. One of the other challenges to obtaining data are breakdowns in public health surveillance and data systems that occur, displaced populations, distant impacts uh, that are hard to measure, and also delayed effects that may occur months or years after a war has ended. Mohammed Jawad and his colleagues at the University College of London in 2020 published a paper in BMC Medicine in which they estimated the number of indirect deaths among civilians uh, over a period from 1990 to 2017, over a 28 year period, during which there were more than 1,100 armed conflicts. Uh, they estimated that there were 29.4 million total deaths during this period, about 1 million. Uh, per year, indirect deaths, most of them due to communicable maternal and neonatal dis disorders and nutritional diseases, and about 20% um, due to non-communicable diseases and a small number due to injuries. Uh, in, during the same period of time, the Uppsala Data Conflict Program in Sweden recorded deaths uh, not only among uh, non-combatant civilians, but combatants as well. And they concluded, and these are deaths that they um, uh, confirmed on a on a case by case basis uh, during this period of time, the same period of time during which Mohammed Jawad and, and his colleagues were estimated about a million uh, uh, indirect deaths per year. Uh, they determined that there were about fifty thousand direct deaths a year uh, in state based armed conflicts, mainly due to explosive uh, weapons. Direct deaths. If we put these two numbers on the same graph and recognizing that the direct deaths is probably an underestimate and the indirect deaths may be in fact an overestimate, nevertheless, um, by this analysis and by studies that have been done in specific wars, such as multiple studies that were done in the Civil War in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the vast majority of deaths in these studies at least were due to indirect causes, not due to the direct effects of explosives and other weapons. So here's this list of uh, the five categories of indirect health impacts that I mentioned at the start. And I wanna say a few words about each of them. Uh, malnutrition can, during war can occur as a result of a number of different uh, mechanisms, you might say. Reduced food production, particularly when farmland is, is destroyed or when landmines have been planted uh, in, in farms damaged infrastructure, roads, markets, and uh, everything that's necessary to get food from uh, the farms uh, to people's tables, diversion or delay in the, in the food supply, which may be uh, caused by um, uh, military uh, preventing uh, food from getting into the country, uh, that is direct food, uh, imp restricting food import, uh, and in effect, using food as a weapon of war, that is restricting food as, uh, so it in effect becomes a, a, a weapon of war when used in this way uh, in violation of uh, international humanitarian law and human rights law. Infants and children, of course, are at highest risk of the direct and indirect effects of malnutrition. 
Uh, one of the indirect effects is that they are at increased risk of both acquiring and dying from uh, various infectious diseases. And we also need to take into consideration micronutrient deficiencies in pregnant women, some of which may result in uh, increased occurrence of birth defects. Regarding communicable diseases, the major two categories are gastrointestinal diseases and respiratory disorders. Gastrointestinal diseases are primarily diarrheal diseases, such as cholera, which can spread easily when there's uh, breakdowns in sanitation and hygiene, and when there's been uh, destruction of uh, water treatment plants and uh, uh, destruction of the, of the infrastructure to grow and uh, supply food safely. Respiratory disorders include measles, COVID-19, tuberculosis, and a variety of other disorders that can easily spread during war, particularly when people are living in crowded conditions. This is a child with measles uh, photograph uh, in a refugee camp a number of years ago. Uh, also, uh, a reason for the spread of communicable diseases is uh, the damage to healthcare facilities, water treatment plants, as I mentioned, and electrical grids, crowded conditions. As shown here, this is a uh, a subway station in Kyiv uh, acting as a bomb shelter during the current war. Uh, when people are crowded together in places like this or in refugee camps, respiratory diseases and indeed diarrheal diseases can spread more easily. Uh, uh, and weakened public health agencies is another reason for the increased occurrence of communicable diseases during war, in part due to limited immunization programs as a result of war, and also because uh, when uh, public health agencies are weakened as a result of war, there are limited human and financial resources to uh, investigate and control outbreaks of disease, and in fact, to undertake surveillance of uh, communicable diseases so these outbreaks can be identified in the first place. And also, there often is increased antimicrobial resistance during war, in part because uh, uh, the most appropriate antibiotics for various infectious diseases are not available. So if people use whatever is available, secondary or even tertiary uh, antibiotics that are not generally recommended. And often they don't take a full course of antibiotics, which leads to the um, a greater likelihood that uh, resistant organisms will develop. Uh, Non-communicable diseases um, are increase in, in uh, prevalence during war, particularly exacerbation of these diseases. We're talking about hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases, asthma and other chronic lung diseases, diabetes, epilepsy, and a number of other chronic non-communicable diseases. The World Health Organization two years ago did a survey in Ukraine, uh, which showed that uh, people had both reduced access to medical care and reduced access to medications. About half of the people re reported at least one barrier to accessing medical care, most commonly cost. Uh, this this uh, fraction or percentage was actually much higher in uh, areas that where there was uh, intensive fighting going on or areas that had been occupied by Ru Russian troops. Uh, there was reduced access to medications. Uh, over 20% of people could not get the medication they needed. And again, this percentage was higher in uh, those areas where there was intense fighting going on, mainly because of cost availability and long waiting lines. And medications that uh, that were most uh, difficult to access were those for common conditions such as hypertension, heart conditions, and pain. So when people with hypertension cannot get their basic medications to control their blood pressure, they're at increased risk of stroke and heart attack. People with asthma, when they can't get their uh, asthma medications, they're at increased risk of severe life-threatening attacks often. People with diabetes, when particularly those who are on insulin, if they can't get their insulin, they, inc they, they are at increased risk of going into diabetic coma and perhaps dying as a result. And people with epilepsy have increased risk of seizures when they can't get their medications, as is true uh, during war. Uh, reproductive health effects uh, increase during war, in part because of decreased prenatal care, decreased presence of trained birth uh, attendants, decreased postpartum and neonatal care, and reduced access to reproductive health services, such as family planning services. As a result, there are increased complications of pregnancy and increased rates of maternal mortality, increased rates of premature and low uh, birth weight infants being born, higher infant death rates, and as I said before, 
uh, in part because of micronutrient deficiencies in pregnancy, but also there's some evidence that uh, exposure to certain toxic substances during war may lead to increased birth defects or congenital anomalies. Mental and behavioral disorders are perhaps the most prevalent and long lasting impacts of war, health impacts of war, including PTSD, depression and anxiety, alcoholism and drug abuse, and suicide. And there are many reasons during war where these, why these problems increase, including physical and sexual trauma, family separation, deaths of loved ones, damage to the physical environment, loss of employment and education, forced displacement, uncertainty about the future, and witnessing of various atrocities. Overwhelming risk factors, overwhelming um, factors that cause mental health problems among people uh, during war. And many of these uh, problems last for uh, months, if not years, after war has ended, and in fact, uh, lead to into generational problems affecting the next generation. I'm not going to touch on this to, to any great extent in this talk because I'm focusing on civilian uh, health effects, but we need, need to keep in mind that military personnel suffer severe injuries and deaths, mental behavioral disorders, and a variety of other problems. And also keep in mind that many military uh, personnel, in fact, were civilians before the war began and were often forced into military service or strongly enticed to serve in the military. There are many violations of human rights during war and in the aftermath of war. I've already mentioned some of them. Uh, they include uh, gender-based violence. They include extrajudicial killings. They include kidnapping of children. Uh, they include, uh, again, attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure, restriction of food and water, forced displacement, denial of humanitarian aid, and use of indiscriminate weapons all of which are in violation of human rights law and international humanitarian law. Uh, I can't give a talk on war without talking about nuclear weapons, 13,000 of which are possessed uh, by the US, Russia, uh, and seven other countries. About 90% of them are held by the US and Russia. Each of these is much larger, almost all of them, that is, is much larger than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They, uh, many of these could be launched by accident or due to misinterpretation or miscommunication among powers, among nuclear powers. And even a small nuclear war could cause huge amounts of casualties, as well as lower the temperatures globally, causing widespread famine. There's widespread environmental damage during war. Some people say that environment is the silent victim of war. It includes chemical contamination of air, water, and soil. Uh, here's a fire and after an explosion in the war in Ukraine. And most of these illustrations I'm going to show are from Ukraine. Uh, landmines and unexploded ordnance. Here's uh, a, a more than 15% uh, of the land in Ukraine is now covered with landmines. Um, and there's much unexploded ordnance there as, as well. Uh, landmines include this R Russian uh, landmine that uh, it does not actually require somebody uh, uh, contacting it to explode, but actually can pick up uh, footsteps or uh, other evidence of, of people nearby and, uh, and it will then explode. Uh, there's increased risk of release of ionizing radiation during war, uh, as shown by the attacks on the Zaporizhia a nuclear plant that have occurred uh, uh, during the war in Ukraine. There's destruction of the built environment. Um, and uh, in Ukraine, as you may have heard, there was a destruction of a major dam, which has led to uh, extensive flooding downstream and uh, many casualties as, as a result of that uh, destruction. Uh, there's also damage to animal habitats and ecosystems that can occur during war. Uh, the next two slides are from the war in Vietnam. Uh, this is a mangrove that was destroyed by Agent Ar Orange a chemical defoliant uh, sprayed uh, on uh, mangroves and other forested areas uh, uh, and, and uh, destroyed those areas. And these are um, other mangrove swamps in Vietnam that to this day have bomb craters that hold stagnant water, which represent uh, breeding grounds for uh, mosquitoes and other disease carrying insects. And also, uh, 
wars uh, and the preparation for war uh, uh, involved military using fossil fuels uh, intensively, which generate greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change. The only way to eliminate the impacts of war, including both the direct and indirect impacts uh, on health, is to eliminate war itself. One way of thinking about the elimination of war is this triangle in the lower left, starting in the lower left, resolving disputes uh, before they uh, before violence erupts. Uh, in the lower right, reducing the root causes of war and strengthening the infrastructure for peace. Uh, uh, let me just give some examples of each of these. Uh, resolving disputes nonviolently depends uh, on diplomacy and arms control and measures to defuse conflicts and to prevent the spread of violence, uh, some of which may be uh, measures from public health that uh, analogous measures that have been used to uh, prevent the spread of uh, uh, communicable diseases. Uh, another approach is uh, addressing the underlying or root causes of war, which include militarism, socioeconomic inequities, ethnic and religious animosities, poor governance, and stresses on the environment. And finally, the, th the third part of the triangle that I just showed involves strengthening the infrastructure of a peace, which includes rehabilitating nations and reintegrating people after war has ended, establishing truth and reconciliation commissions, deploying international peacekeepers, strengthening civil society, promoting the rule of law, ensuring citizen participation, and holding aggressors accountable. Two are the things that are extremely important in terms of developing uh, and maintaining a sustainable peace uh, after war has ended. One is the involvement of women in the peace process. It has been shown that when women are directly involved in the peace process, peace is much more likely to be uh, uh, maintained and sustained for many years. The other realization is that uh, peace treaties that are imposed from above or by external countries or external organizations are less likely to see, succeed uh, compared with uh, uh, peace that is generated from the grassroots up. So these are some of the things to think about in terms of uh, strengthening peace uh, uh, once, once war has ended. Uh, one of the greatest risk factors for a war is a, a, is a previous war uh, where the issues have not been resolved and where uh, an infrastructure for peace, sustainable peace, has not been developed. In my book, From Horror to Hope, and I know we've been talking a lot about the horrors uh, of hope today, uh, horrors of war today, I want to point out some of the reasons we should be hopeful. One is the re resolution of many disputes without violence. An example of that is that there are over 250 river systems in the world that are shared by two or more countries. Yes, indeed, there have been outbreaks of violence among these countries, but much more often than not, these disputes are settled without violence. Another is an increased protection of human rights, uh, at least when we look at it in terms of uh, on a global basis, improved and more systematic humanitarian assistance, effectiveness of many international treaties, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which we don't hear too much about these days, and indeed we've heard about the use of chemical weapons in the, in, in the civil war in Syria. But indeed, there's been extraordinary progress in um, destroying vast stockpiles of uh, chemical weapons that existed for many years as a result of the Chemical Weapons Convention. So here's an example of an international treaty that has been very effective in uh, controlling uh, some weapons of mass destruction. Another reason for hope is the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was passed by uh, the United Nations in 2017 and uh, went into effect in 2021. It's now been sat signed or ratified by 160 countries. It makes it illegal to develop, test, produce, acquire, possess, store, transfer, transport, or plan to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons. It requires the nuclear weapon states to destroy these weapons and ter terminate their programs. Uh, interestingly, the nine nuclear weapon states have chosen not to sign this treaty. It mandates assistance for victims of nuclear weapons testing and use and requires that contaminated areas be re remediated. 
So even though the major, the, the nuclear weapon states have not uh, uh, signed or ratified this treaty, nevertheless, it's a reason for hope that uh, so many countries of the world are supporting this initiative. Um, more people and organizations are, are, are working to prevent war and promote peace. And included among them are health professionals. And I, I want to briefly list and discuss some of the roles that health professionals can play. Uh, one obvious role is the care of victims. And indeed, many health professionals are very, uh, much involved in the care of victims, not only in war zones and in refugee camps, but uh, people in, in our own communities who have been uh, perhaps military personnel in the past or uh, refugees from war zones um, who uh, need special care, often mental health care, as a result of their exposure to war. Uh, documentation and research is a role that health professionals can play. Uh, a good friend of mine named James Kobe, who's a surgeon, uh, worked in the uh, 1980s in Southeast Asia, mainly in Cambodia, uh, treating victims of landmine injuries. Um, as he was treating uh, hundreds of people, largely children, who were maimed as a result of landmines, uh, he documented what he was seeing and, and the people he was treating. And he and others who were undergoing uh, you know, this documentation of these landmine uh, casualties uh, conducted research that uh, indicated how widespread this problem was. Uh, Jim Kobe and others then played major roles in getting the landmine treaty, which was uh, passed, I believe, in 1997, the so-called Ottawa Treaty. Documentation of these landmine, these landmine injuries played an important role in uh, leading up to and, and bringing about the uh, landmine treaty, which has gone a long way to destroying many of the landmines uh, in the world and getting uh, many countries to sign on to uh, agreeing not to uh, produce or store or uh, deploy landmines at any time. Uh, awareness raising and education is an important role that health professionals can play. And finally, advocating for the prevention of war and the promotion of peace. Now, I do want to leave a little time for questions, but I want to first have you do another eyes closed exercise. And I'd like you all to close your eyes again. And what I'd like you to do is imagine what it would be like to be living in a world without war. Keep your eyes closed. What do you see? What do you hear? How is your life different than living in a war zone? What are you no longer worried about? How is your life different than living in a world where military force is used to resolve disputes among nations or within nations? How can the resources that were previously used for military purposes now be used? What do you see as possible? And when you have a clear picture of a world without war, you can open your eyes and uh, join me in discussion of some of the things we've talked about today. So I welcome your, your comments, your questions. Um, I usually find this to be the most valuable part of uh, of a presentation to interact uh, with you and others. So um, I welcome your comments and uh, questions. Hi, uh, Dr. Levy. Um, thank you very much for, for sharing your, your your thoughts and your expertise in this in this area. Um, actually, we already have one question um, that has come in. Um, I think because our audience is a little bit um, are likely people working more in the local Singapore like healthcare setting, um, and maybe are more 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 so like onlookers of like humanitarian um, emergencies and crises around the world. Um, what would be your thoughts about how you know people working on the ground in Singapore, like healthcare professionals, public health specialists, allied health, and all that? How can we play a role? Um, in, in helping to prepare for and manage these like adverse effects of war. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I and I, it's, um, uh, I go back to the slide that's, uh, I believe, still on the screen there that, uh, uh, you know, these are four of the ways, and of course there are others, but um, th there are people in our own communities who have 
uh, perhaps served in militaries or served perhaps even in peacekeeping operations in other countries, war-torn countries. Um, there are uh, refugees and, and others who are, uh, I believe, living in Singapore and living in, in communities in the United States um, and in communities that we as healthcare professionals serve who um, have been affected by war. And uh, sometimes these people prefer not to talk about that or, uh, you know, it may be affecting them in many ways, but they they hold it in, so to speak. And so I, I think there are opportunities to perhaps discover in our own communities uh, people who have been affected in one way or another as a result of war or people who indeed may have relatives in countries that are at war now or being affected by war who are um, you know, affected mentally and, and perhaps otherwise as a result of, uh, of uh, you know, having relatives or close friends and acquaintances in, in war zones. So, um, you know, at, at first it's, it, it's um, you know, many people think that it, particularly if they're living in a peaceful country like Singapore, that uh, this does not relate to them. But indeed, there are many people uh, in our own communities, people that we serve in, in healthcare. Uh, and and related services uh, who are suffering the effects of war, or you know either have suffered the effects directly, or maybe if uh, being affected indirectly, uh, perhaps simply by worry about what's happening uh, in other countries in the world. And then I've I've listed other things here uh, and I talked a little bit about already, but uh, ways in which um, uh, people who uh, you know in their current practices, or if they have worked in a war zone or a place adjacent to a war zone, um, uh, maybe seeing, you know, war-related health problems. I think it's important to document those in some way, to see if there um, uh, are areas of research that might contribute to uh, our understanding of the health impacts of war and their prevention um, and their treatment, of course. Um, things that, you know, like we're doing today, uh, engaging in uh, awareness raising and educational sessions um, among colleagues, among our students, among uh, the communities that we serve and, and we live and work in, uh, and advocating for um, measures that we believe can help to uh, prevent and reduce the occurrence of uh, the adverse consequences of war that we talked about today, uh, and also to promote peace, to strengthen uh, peace in our, um, our own societies and encourage the uh, strengthening of, of peace in, in other in other societies as well. Uh, we're, we're suddenly getting a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, but um, I'm seeing two questions that maybe have some relation to one another. So thinking about um kind of the immediate response to um to conflict and war um we have a question here about what uh about what considerations are necessary uh, when conducting like rapid needs assessments in war zone conflict -affect afflicted areas um how that may be different um than the regular needs assessment conducted in like non-war areas um as well as how and I, i'll get to the second part but uh, maybe answer this first part first Sure. Uh, it, uh, so and there are major challenges in providing health care in, in uh, war zones and, and, for example, just taking displacement as, as one part of it. You know, as people are displaced, they're you know, physically displaced from their surroundings, they're f physically displaced from their uh, usual ways of, of accessing health care. When families are separated and, and communities are, are broken up uh, and people uh, you know, are, are displaced, that they lose their uh, support systems, their psychological and social support systems um, that uh, you know play a, an important role in, in health. Um, and and certainly, if people are displaced, it, it's it's challenging to uh, maintain uh, at least the semblance of continuity of care. Obviously, uh, uh, for you know certain acute conditions, it's they're more easily treated. But we're talking about something like uh, tuberculosis, which requires uh, continuity of care for effective treatment, um, th that's a really a big tr challenge. So, um, you know, there are, you know, it, it, there are different levels of uh, up by which people are affected during war. There are people who are 
you know, right in the midst of a war zone where there may be, you know, ongoing shooting going on within their own community. Um, and, and the focus there may be simply on uh, providing immediate care for those who are, who are wounded or uh, experiencing some other acute health problem. Um, there are, you know, somewhat more stable situations in, let's say, refugee camps where people have uh, much more serious needs on average than, uh, you know, a population living in a country of peace. Um, but nevertheless, there need to be, um, you know, ways of providing care. Uh, very important in um, in war zones, but as an example, in, in refugee camps as well, is conducting surveillance of disease, particularly uh, communicable diseases, so that they can be identified uh, early and measures could be taken uh, to prevent the spread of those diseases. So it's important for clinicians, for example, to work closely with public health people to have that to have that happen. Uh, when I worked in a refugee camp, a, a, a Cambodian refugee camp in Thailand uh, in 1980, so many, many years ago, uh, but some of the things we did then were, you know, still apply today. Um, we we had a surveillance system um, that was run by the public health department in the camp with uh, input from from um, physicians and others who had come from other countries that that helped to identify nine cases of polio at an early stage. Uh, and and when that was identified, a uh, intensive oral polio vaccination campaign was begun. So and that's just one example of. Um, you know, things that need to be uh, done with public health and, and clinical care working hand in hand. You said there was a second part of that question? Yeah, so I think I think um, it kind of related to that. Earlier we talked about how there could be some um, sort of like underreporting or overreporting the numbers um, as far as like, and it kind of related to the needs of the, of the people post uh, in these conflict spaces, right? Um, I guess it's related to kind of how do you how do you find like, reliable information? How do you prevent misinformation? Um, it's, it's, is there, is there really like a truth commission or some form? No, no. It was, in, indeed, uh, you know, the final answers may not be known, well, may never be known in terms of the number of people who have been died or seriously injured or made ill as a result of war. And often it's not until systematic uh, epidemiologic studies are done, you know, population-based studies after the war uh, to try to estimate, you know, what has happened. But even that is fraught with problems because people have moved away. Uh, sometimes whole villages are wiped out, and and uh, you know you, you can't begin to get accurate numbers and so forth. So um, uh, it, it's very difficult, and um, you know it's understandable that uh, one's own side, so to speak, and and that's perhaps not the right wording, but that, you know one's one's own country may be uh, minimizing. Uh, the um, the injuries and deaths among its military and maximizing uh, the estimated uh, uh, deaths and injuries uh, on the other side, so to speak. Uh, I think that happens frequently during war. And, um, you know, it's it's um, uh, coming up with exact numbers uh, is, is or even approximate numbers during war is, is a very big challenge. So I think we're getting a theme of uh, a couple of questions um, talking about um, sort of international versus like local um, response to to wartime situations. Um, I guess um, could you speak a little bit more about what um, like what the role of like, international organizations are um, in in the in response yeah. to war. Um, yeah, yeah so, I mean, these are all you know. Um, more complex uh, questions than I can easily answer in a short period of time. But to identify some of the issues, let me say this. Um, it's important for international organizations who are providing uh, immediate uh, response to humanitarian emergencies that they are there to uh, supplement um, what uh, might be done by existing uh, medical care. Now, obviously, a, a, a war uh, generally overwhelms um, a a country's existing uh, healthcare system, so they're very dependent on international organizations. But I think international humanitarian organizations must uh, be mindful of the local uh, needs, uh, the local customs, uh, and work work in partnership wherever possible with um, uh, you know people from that that country who are 
um, that is health health professionals and others uh, to provide a, a assistance. I think all too often um, aid is provided in a way that um, is not mindful, is not sensitive to uh, the needs and the culture of the population being served. Um, I think one of the other things that is very important is that um, when a, a, a natural disaster occurs or when a war occurs or a famine occurs, there's often a great deal of international um, you know, information, information in the international news media and social media. But once the immediate crisis passes, um, inadequate attention is paid to the problem. And often uh, after uh, you know, many of the humanitarian workers go back to their own countries, uh, th there aren't sufficient resources to deal with the, the ongoing problems left by the war. Um, and, and I think one of the challenges for uh, humanitarian aid organizations that are providing you know, immediate emergency relief is to help to create, to facilitate uh, uh, ongoing sustainable uh, healthcare, public health services and other services uh, for the affected population. And so I, I think that's, that's a big challenge that um, you know, often arises. Yeah, I think that kind of plays into one of the other questions where we're getting past, which is like, where do you where do you even begin, right? Um, if you're coming into a space like that, um, like how do you begin to address some of these um, healthcare concerns? Because yeah. it's it's so varied, it's so many. Um, right. And, yeah. So so um, I I heard somebody once describe um, uh, well, to give advice to um. Uh, humanitarian aid workers who were going on their first mission and and their advice their initial advice was stop and listen that is don't rush in and begin doing things stop uh assess the situation you know as, as part of a team ideally um see what's wanted and needed um and and uh listen to people uh and and uh rely heavily on uh, what you see and what you hear locally, as opposed to what directives you may be given from um, some organization in another part of the world, you know, for, you know wh where the organization you're serving with is is based. So th that's very important, I think, to 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 listen. Um, another thing that's done um, increasingly and inc increasingly done well is to do uh, rapid assessments. Uh, that is systematically. Uh, conducting rapid assessments, assistant assessments, excuse me, rapid assessments of health needs, um, uh, looking at, for example, um, mortality rates, uh, causes of mortality, uh, causes of severe illness, um, and and gathering objective data and certainly sub subjective data as well, uh, so you can determine where the greatest need is. Um, you know where. You know, in, in terms of location, in terms of what subgroups of the population have greatest immediate needs, uh, where can resources be uh, best utilized so that uh, you're not wasting your energy uh, supplying services that are not needed or um, working on problems that are uh, less important than other problems? Um, great. Um, we have a question. We have a couple of questions actually talking about. Um, Kind of uh, on the ground civilian response or like access. Um, so one of it was um, or like kind of over time. Have you seen any changes in the in how access to healthcare has been in these like, conflict with the areas and um, over over time? Has there been has there been any change or progress in the way? Yeah, access very, to good, very, very good question. I, I you know it's um. It, uh, first of all, humanitarian assistance has become much more systematic and um, uh, evidence-based and um, organizations, and I would say the, the humanitarian assistance community globally is um, learning from its experience and providing humanitarian assistance in a much more systematic way uh, as time has gone on. This has clearly been improvement in that area. Uh, number two, there's been, I, I think as a result of Social media and improved other you know, forms of communication, uh, the use of uh, you know cell phones and be able to to share uh, 
immediately photo, you know, uh, images of uh, and and sound of what's what's happening in a in a war zone and descriptions um, uh, has uh, created a greater understanding of um, what the needs are in various places and and created I would say a, a, a increased solidarity among health uh, professionals throughout the world. I think there's uh, and, and that solidarity, that kind of international support for uh, physicians, nurses, and other uh, uh, healthcare workers and, and humanitarian workers uh, uh, does a great deal to um, support them in, in their um, important and often very courageous work. Um, so those are a couple of things that I've I've seen over time, and and certainly I guess the third thing clearly is that there are many more. Uh, health professionals and others who are getting directly engaged in helping to provide assistance uh, in areas that are affected by war or uh, adjacent countries. Um, one thing that I would caution people about is that is not to just, you know, pick up uh, whatever you're doing and and go to a, a war in the middle of a war zone without some degree of preparation and training and um, and working ideally working uh, as part of an organization that has a lot of experience in doing that. Uh, sometimes by simply going and trying to get into a war zone and, and, and bringing your skills, but not very much knowledge or know-how as to how to work in that situation, you may be causing more of a problem than uh, contributing to um, uh, you know, improving the situation. Um, and then just to follow up from there, like, do you, are there any sort of um insights into behavior of the civilians when it comes to um, war, like war situations. Like, does it, is there any sort of like stockpiling behavior that comes about um, even like pre post war or you know, what kind of behaviors you've seen on the ground? I, I, I missed a word or two there. Okay. You're asking about civilian behavior? Yeah. So either in like a pre or post war situation, kind of like are there, um, things like stockpiling, um, similar to what we see, oh, I, I see. So you saw during that, the that, pandemic. That, that, that may be that may be counterproductive. I mean, people were stockpiling food or or water, and so it's not available to other people. I, you know, it, it, that's something that's hard to measure. I I don't know the answer to the question. I do know though that there are many situations in war zones where um, people go out of their way to help one another, and uh, you know, uh, maybe even you know people who. Uh, have have differences among themselves prior to the war or whatever. Uh, I think there are many more instances of cooperation and and a shared um, uh, feeling that you know we're in it together. We're going to help each other out. Um, let's look in on our neighbors. Let's let's uh, help each other to escape if that's what we choose to do. Um, so. Um, I, I don't have a lot of you know firsthand information on that, but my impression is that more often than not, people act in a a very positive way in terms of helping their their you know neighbors and others uh, uh, rather than uh, acting in ways that are detrimental. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as we're coming to time, um, I, I do want to acknowledge that we do have a lot of. We did have a couple other questions um, talking about like, um, you know, pragmatic ways to to promote peace uh, and like um, the rights of one nation to intervene in many other nations of like, disputes. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can maybe um, um, get you to answer to some of these questions offline and maybe we'll follow up from there. Yeah. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask my colleague Natasha to put in the link for our um, our survey um, in the chat, um, and I'll also put up a, a QR code for people to scan as well. Um, give me one second. Um, and in the meantime, um, Dr. Yuli, if you have any like kind of parting words for our audience today, kind of like take home messages you want them to to keep as they as they walk away from this uh, webinar. Yeah, I, I say the one thing is, you know, it, it could be argued that war and the preparation for war and the the extensive, uh, often intergenerational impacts of war uh, that occur rep represent the largest public health problem in the world. 
And I think each of us has a certain responsibility to um, see, you know, knowing our own skills, our own situation, how can we uh, address this issue? How can we, uh, it, it, it may be, uh, you know, having more sessions like this one in terms of discussing discussing issues. It may be uh, educating ourselves about, um, uh, you know, what are the different ways in which we can contribute? Um, it may be uh, educating others and raising awareness in our own communities about uh, these issues. These are major issues that often don't get addressed um, and and need to be addressed uh, uh, more often. Uh, thanks so much, Prof. Um, um, Evelyn here. I just wanted to um, tell everybody on the panel as well, and as well as people who are there um, right now remotely watching, that we definitely would want to answer every single question. I mean, I'm very, very heartened by the fact that we actually have 16, 17 over questions and of a variety from just implementation all the way to the science behind it. Um, so, uh, uh, Prof, if you're all right with it, we'll probably compile all the questions onto a short like question and answer anonymously and um, so people will know who's asking these questions. And, you know, Prof, you can just um in your own time perhaps uh, answer these questions and we'll send it out to every single one of the 150, 160 over attendees that are actually here online and remotely watching. Um, so I appreciate all the questions. I, I, I see you guys, the 17 questions. I see you guys and I really want to answer all these questions. Yeah. So once again, thank you very much for your time. And thanks so much, Prof, for attending, even though you're like, you know, millions of miles away. Um, I think, if anything, I'm also very heartened to the fact that a lot of people in our own world in Singapore want to do something internationally and want to step step forward of our own comfort zone and care for the nation and, and for the rest of the world. So I'm very heartened by that. Um, so, yeah, once again, thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. Thanks so much, Prof, for, for your time and, and for all the slides and all the information that's given. Um, so hope everyone enjoyed and um, good Friday to everybody. Good. Thank you. Thank you all.